I am going to be talking about APTs in general, but I'm actually speaking about information warfare, but not even about information warfare in general. I just want to tell you why the internet has made information warfare different. That's it. So um, opaque at both ends, how the internet blew up information warfare. And this outline actually bears no resemblance to the talk, but this is what you should take away anyway. Um, so the first thing we need to know is like, when you're doing information warfare, what you're actually doing is you're attacking an information processing system. So you can attack a company or a nation or a group or an individual. Um, you, you're going after basically the way that something operates based on information that it takes in. So you want to understand how the information gets processed, then how decisions are made, and then how that leads to action. In theory, it's very, very easy. Uh, in practice, it's not, um, unless you're going after the Americans. Um, so all of this stuff has kind of gotten easier with what uh, the Russian Federation in 2000 called the cyber psychosocial environment which apparently hasn't taken up um, as a term. After that, we're going to like pop into what makes the internet really, really cool. And then I'm going to go into why. And then I'm going to have the last word. Um, so very quickly, the reason that you should listen to me is I've been doing this forever. Um, I've been like speaking for 20 years, doing research 20 years. Uh, I've done. Uh, information warfare since maybe five years ago, a bit less. Um, and I find it very, very interesting. Um, there's not quite a lot of uh, opportunities for people to practice information warfare freelance. So uh, I had to go the other way. I'm a thought leader. <laughs> okay. So information warfare is very, very simple. It's the exact same thing as marketing. Uh, essentially, what you do is you take your best message, like the best thing you could possibly say, you take the best channel that you can say it over, and then you hope that it works. So you hope for the best. And that's basically how everything has worked for a very, very long time. And it gets you things like this. This is your classic high prestige, high prestige channel, and a very expensive watch. Like This is straightforward how it all works. And if you take the same techniques and you use them for um, information warfare purposes, you get stuff like this, right? The Germans have landed in Canada. You know, the, all these horrible things that the Germans are doing. So this is from World War II when what the British were trying to do is they were trying to convince the Canadians to commit troops and people and sort of join up and go and fight the Germans because they were trying to say, um, the only thing that will work is total victory. Like, the Germans are not going to stop once they take over Europe. Like, you're next, so beat them here, otherwise you'll have to beat them at home. Um, and to make sure that people understood who it was coming from, they have this little, uh, none of these things has happened yet. So this is actually white propaganda. It's actually attributed. And this sort of thing works because we're all people, and people have been the same for a very, very long time. Um, the thing about people is that we respond to pretty much the same things, and we always have. And so if you know how that works, you're good to go. Unfortunately, when you're doing black propaganda, which is when you are impersonating uh, a member of the group that you're attacking, you generally have this problem which is uh, called opaque at both ends. So the problem is, the people that are receiving the message don't know where it comes from, so it's opaque. And you, as someone sending the message, don't know what happens. So again, it's opaque. So you end up sending something. They don't know where it's from. Um, you sort of hope for the best, and you don't know if they got it. So you've, you've got this terrible problem, which, again, it's opaque at both ends. So black goes to black. And the way that you beat that is you have to have an evil genius. And your evil genius has to completely understand the culture that you're targeting so that they can tailor messages and they can produce messaging that will resonate with your target. And in theory, that works because we're all people. 
and people are basically people, and it doesn't really matter uh, who they are or where they are, as long as you can get something that resonates, you'll be fine. The problem is you have to resonate with the right group. Right? If, you, if you don't hit the right tribal group, your message fails. And even though people are people, unless you make sure that the right people are getting the right message, um, it's not going to get you anywhere. So this is a North Korean classic example. You've got a nice divide. You can see there's two tribal groups. But things have changed. Right? These days, it actually doesn't matter uh, which location you're in. Like, tribal groups are no longer created by geography. You're no longer in the same tribal group as your neighbor simply because they're your neighbor. Right? What we do instead is we find uh, some characteristic of our personhood, um, like your job, your interest, your religion, or something like that, and use that to establish your tribal group. So you take a piece that you feel identifies you, and you join a group that also identifies like that, which is how we have things like this, like InfoSec, where we all like computer stuff, and we're therefore connected via that, even though we don't live in the same village. So it doesn't matter who your neighbors are anymore. You can be all alone and still part of like, the wider community. I don't really have much to say. I just think it's a really cool picture. <laughs> um, but like, we're going to change gears slightly and talk about, so where does that get us with InfoWars? So we know that there's like tribal groups, that they're virtual tribes based on ideology, and that we need to tailor a message that's going to resonate with them, and we want to impersonate someone within that tribal group. And if you are completely shocked by this, you know, welcome to 2016. And you know, this is a very, very classic example of InfoWar. It was very, very basic. Um, and it turned out to work, which by all rights it shouldn't have, given how terrible it was. Um, it was made up mostly of bots. Um, and the problem, of course, is that even though it was done very, very poorly, uh, it's become what a lot of people view as the state of the art. Um, so while it was very, very basic and sort of it hit the right points, it was not particularly creative and really, really cool. Like, it's no Sefton Delmer. So everyone that's getting ready to fight bots is getting ready to fight the last war. Right? Like, they're all tooled up, they're ready to go, but they're going to really get it wrong because they are literally doing things like this. Right? This is how they're training Cybercom to fight memetic warfare. <laughs> they have people in rooms looking at memes, taking notes. Sarcasm. Good. All right. <laughs> All right. So that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not a meme. That's, that's, you got it all wrong. And the, the thing is, it's because they believe things like this were memes. And these are not memes. These are not designed to be shown to people outside of your tribal group. These are propaganda posters. Right? It's literally the same thing. Right? Join us and help. We can do it. You know? It's just straightforward propaganda. It's, it's speaking to your tribal group and trying to get them to come together and do a thing that you want them to do, which is cool, but it's not actually Infowar. So what you, you end up with is you don't really know what you're doing, so you try and copy it, and you end up with a very poor copy. And if you don't know what's actually going on, you're going to make something that looks like it's right, and it should be right, but it's really not. And that's because fundamentally, information war and cyber war is Calvin ball. Like, it's not supposed to make sense. The rules are not the same all the time. They change constantly. And you can make them change if you want to, right? And if you don't do that, you're going to think that you've done the best thing you possibly can, and you're going to get blindsided by a bear for, you know, no real reason. But so that is like cyber war in a nutshell. Like, there's this, all this info war and stuff. But why did the internet make information warfare different? Um, because of Randy Savage, obviously. 
The, the really, really simple thing is, uh, remember when I said that uh, black propaganda was opaque at both ends? The sender doesn't know if it works, and the receiver doesn't know where it comes from? That's no longer true. Now it's only opaque at one end, and the other end has complete transparency. And they have complete transparency because the internet gives them special capabilities. For instance, feedback loops. Feedback loops are like the one thing that you need to focus on if you want to do better at whatever you're doing. So if you tighten your feedback loop, you will improve dramatically. During World War II, the feedback loops, um, they were called comebacks, and you'd basically get it by uh, capturing prisoners of war and then overhearing them in uh, the cages where they were, and you would see if they were talking about your propaganda campaign. So that's a very, very weak way of getting uh, feedback on your campaign. And it would take, if you were lucky, one month, two months. More realistically, it would take six to eight months, and you would never get it. Like, that's most of what happened. So what we have with the internet now is we actually have the ability to do like engagement metrics. We can see if people like what we're doing. We can see if people click on what we're doing. We can see like what is actually happening. And we can see this propaganda campaign is working, and this one is not. Let's ditch this one and double down over here. Um, the other thing we can do is we've got huge amounts of data on people. So we don't need someone who has grown up in the target environment and knows them really, really well. We just need a lot of data about the target environment. Um, for example, if you are China, you have a huge amount of data on your target environment because you've hacked OPM, you've hacked all the hotels, you've hacked um, you know, all the airlines. You have massive amounts of information and data, and you could just mine that, and that will allow you to understand who you're actually going for. You can, you can create small, targeted, tight groups. And you could do that just because you've got huge amounts of data. And then the other thing that the internet lets you do is other than having very, very tight feedback loops and being able to tailor your message to your actual group, you can deliver it directly to them. So historically, when you're doing like a radio broadcast or a TV broadcast or you're dropping leaflets, you've got to go fairly broad, right? You don't know exactly who's going to get it, if they're going to get it. Um, like, I don't have time for it, but there's great anecdotes about, like, it took months for the British to realize that they were sending over a frequency that got bounced off the Earth before it reached Norway. So they were trying to hit Norway with radio, and it wasn't working because they got, like, the, the waves, so it just, like, skipped straight over Norway and, like, landed somewhere else. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're not going to have that anymore. You can literally deliver it to exactly who you want. And then you've got computers, so everything's like fast and free and flexible and whatever. The thing is that these are not, like people will come out and they'll say, things are different because computers, and that's not true. Um, what computers give you is nothing that a nation state needs, right? Nation states are not cost sensitive. Nation states are not inhibited by like, not having enough people to throw at a problem. Um, they're not inhibited by speed at the implementation end, they're inhibited by they're bureaucracies. So even though they could implement something fairly quickly, it might take two months to do all the meetings before they can agree to actually uh, do the attack. So relatively speaking, I have a lot of slides on this, but relatively speaking, feedback is a big one. Like, that's your big win. Feedback is what lets you say, this is doing well or this is doing poorly. And because you can do that without actually speaking to anyone or knowing anything, you don't actually need to know much about your targets. Right? You could just A-B test your way to a disinfo campaign. Um, data science allows you to tailor. Delivery allows you to hit it to the people that you've tailored it for, but they're useless without each other. And yeah, that's kind of rubbish. So uh, as I was saying, feedback is your big win. Like You get immediate info on how you're doing. Is this going well? Is this going poorly? Um, tailoring is good. You can get the people that you actually want to receive your message to uh, be clustered into the right groups, and then you can target them with specific delivery. And all of that gets you to the point where you don't actually need geniuses anymore. You can do it with anyone. 
You just need someone who can read a pie chart and go, OK, let's do this one more, because it's bigger. That's it. So you save on implementation, but more specifically, you don't have to find the right people. You just need to find anyone. And if you have them, you can make them do, you can make them uh, competent enough to lead your target audience anywhere you want. Because you can just A, B test, you can get feedback, you can make sure that you're hitting the right target audience, and so on. Um, so this is what you get these days. You don't need a genius. If, on the other hand, you try and do all of this without a genius, uh, you end up with this, which is a leaflet that the US Army made during the Vietnam War. And they were dropping it on uh, North Vietnam. And it says, uh, don't deny yourself the right to be a man. And to Americans, they were like, this will make them miss their wives and girlfriends, and they'll want to go home. And to the North Vietnamese, this was, our daughters are being corrupted by Americans and being forced into sex work. We have to get rid of them. So it turned out that because they didn't have feedback, they were dropping uh, propaganda on the enemy that made the enemy hate them even more. So you need feedback, otherwise you think that everyone's an American. Where is that going to take us? Well, I think the cyber thing is going to catch on. Uh, it's probably going to be very useful going forward. I suspect that the ability to send information to people that you want to read information and be able to adjust their processing and change how they think about things, that's going to be an important capability, and you want to get on that. And the good news is you can do that as long as you invest in very, very basic stuff. Um, the other thing is people have been freaking out about this forever, right? Like, this is nothing new. It's not really that scary. And, you know, it, we'll figure it out. Like, it's not going to be the end of the world. It never is. And before I go, I'm going to leave you with the most awesome thing. I actually have a copy of Russia's secret tradecraft manual for disinformation. And you can get it too. <laughs> 99 cents on Amazon. Um, and that's literally all you need. You have this, you've got everything that they did. You're good. So, thank you. That's it.